welcome back to the Novelty Podcast. We have a bit of a hiatus, but we are back. We are. My name is Alexandra. And I'm Emily. And today we have a bit of a unique podcast today. Usually I'm here to say what the writer owes the reader, but here today we're going to talk about what the writer does not owe the reader. And usually I talk about what the reader owes the book, but today I'm going to scold all of you all for being crazy <laughs> and sometimes exhibiting bad reader behavior. Sometimes uncomfortably bad reader behavior. Yes, this is going to be focused on the world of romance, romance novels. There's been a couple of incidences that have happened in reader-writer spaces, some incidences that have happened kind of more broadly on the book internet. Right. And, you know, I want to kind of start us by framing the conversation because we've talked a lot about reviewing, right. how, being critical of books. We've certainly said our piece about books that we don't like. And that's been huge in the internet book world too with authors coming out and, you know, some of them being very comfortable with like, you know, I accept what reviews come in for me. Like, you know, mm -hmm. this is your space to say what you want. And other authors, I think inappropriately being like, you don't dare give my book, you know, less than three stars, which mm -hmm. That's not good author behavior, right. but it's been a very hot button topic about leaving reviews and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate mm -hmm. when you should leave reviews. And you know, I think some authors feel like, you know, if you didn't like my book, just don't leave a review and hurt me. I think there is like a time and a place to leave a negative review mm -hmm. if you truly feel like this book is poorly written mm -hmm. or in some cases like is like offensive <laughs> and the idea is like, I don't think that you should be afraid to be like, hey, I have criticisms of this, of this book. book. Yeah. But not all reader criticisms fall into those categories. categories, like should be giving reviews. Yeah. And I think, you know, we are just kind of like summarize our position is like, it's totally appropriate for readers to feel comfortable providing critique. And I think the point of reviews is to speak to other readers so other readers right. can learn about the book and if you know read if they're comfortable reading it and exactly you know and it's not directed towards an author because it's already done and published what are they going to do edit it right. now no it's not for authors right and then at the same time we're huge advocates that authors should go out and creative people in general they should have full license to pursue their creative ends that right. they should be free to write what they feel called to write that's the stories that they have in their hearts and imaginations those are the stories that they should be writing i feel honestly that it's like a should like not mm -hmm. just like you know oh i can write what i mm -hmm. want to write like you're going to write better books yeah. <laughs> if you're writing the book you want to write mm -hmm. if you're writing a book that you don't want to write but the internet says you're going to write mm -hmm. wow that's when you get some real bad books <laughs> yeah and i think you know our authors are under a lot of market pressure a lot of eyes on authors these days and so i understand sort of feeling the pressure of that you know, well, the, the pressure of that pressure. The, <laughs> the author space has changed a lot over mm -hmm. the decades. We used to kind of have this like romanticized view of authors as like people who, you know, lived in their little cottages in the woods and wrote books and didn't have like a ton of interaction with their readers. Mm -hmm. And that is a yeah. complete myth now. Like yeah. now, especially if you're independent puzzling or you're just getting started with like your first book, like you have to be very, very present and engaged mm -hmm. in posting a lot, talking to your readers, mm -hmm. having conversations like that. what is required of you now in order to sell a book. That's yeah. just, yeah. sorry, that's just the way it is. It's part and parcel of the job. I mean, we used to only have the rare, you know, celebrity author, a Stephen King, a JK Rowling. But now, as we know, with social media, everybody needs to have presence. And with social media comes parasocial relationships. Right. To start with, like, authors shouldn't only look at that as a negative because, mm -hmm. you know, there was a time in which, like, if you couldn't get an agent, you weren't going to get a book published and yeah. you there were no chances. But now, because of social media, authors have, and self-publishing, authors have the ability to strike out on their own and sell books directly to readers. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Yeah. What's not great <laughs> is when readers, like, and we all struggle with this, you know, I think this is a problem with internet culture across the board is being immature with your concept of what a parasocial relationship is. Right. That sense that you feel like you know this person when you don't, and the sense that you might feel like you have the right to make demands of this person. And we get that kind of that attitude from like, well, I bought your book. Mm -hmm. Spending, 
even like $15 for a whole book is not a ticket yeah. to like, now I have the right to interact with you on any level I choose. We have this idea, I think sometimes where like, oh, I put money down, mm -hmm. I supported you, therefore mm -hmm. I have rights. Mm -hmm. When that's not what really- What you have rights to is the copy of the book okay. that you got. Exactly. <laughs> you got something for that $15. That was yeah. the book. That's what you got for yeah. that $15. That's where that you receive it. <laughs> so, yeah. so give us some, some examples of, you know, this parasocial relationship with readers going too far, with readers taking advantage of or trying to take advantage of authors. Well, I'm actually gonna go to like probably what's the most extreme example I've seen because it's like the oldest example mm -hmm. I have, like the first one I've heard of. I am going to give a spoiler to a book. So you've, you've been given the notice that I'm going to spoil Charlene Harris's well, they, the books were originally called the Sookie Stackhouse Mysteries. Now we know them as True Blood. That's a much better title. <laughs> it's so much funny. <laughs> it's adorable, you know? Yeah. But the final book in the series, I think it was like 13, was published in 2012, which that's still an area where like authors are getting online more, but it's not the level that they are today, right? Yeah. And the book ends with Sookie, the main character, deciding that she doesn't actually have to be in a romantic relationship with anyone to be okay in and of mm -hmm. herself. And so there's no like grand romantic ending to that. She's kind of like, well, I think I'm gonna end up in a relationship with this person, but if it doesn't work out, I realize I'm okay. Yeah. You know, that's how Charlene Harris chose to end the book that she spent like a decade reading, writing, right? Mm -hmm. People literally sent her death threats because they thought Sookie should end up in some kind of romantic, mm -hmm. great relationship, have that like crazy epilogue where everything yeah. is perfect and fantastic. And the idea that that makes you sit down and either type out or write, I, sometimes this was a time when people were still getting mail, you yeah. know, write out death threats to an author mm -hmm. demanding that you change this book or I'm going to kill you, yeah. which I'm fully aware. The person who wrote those letters is probably like, I wasn't actually going to That doesn't change how Charlene Harris felt right. about the situation. Like right. that's not okay. You Death know, threats are still, let's just say, cause apparently this is something that needs to be said. I don't know a circumstance where it is appropriate to write a death threat at all. But definitely not about a novel. Yeah. So we're going to get that, like we're going to deal with that right off the bat. There's no period <laughs> yeah. in which relating to like, we'll just, we'll just say relating to books, we'll start there. Yeah. That like you need to threaten the author in any way, shape or form because the book didn't end the way you wanted it to. Yeah. Like that's frustrating and disappointing. And you're allowed to say, I didn't like the ending. Yeah. You're allowed to say, I think the ending would have been better with ABC or it wasn't a successful event re ending for these three reasons. Yeah. That's engaging in that's criticism of the text. That's the correct space to yeah. be like, I mean, I would even say like, if you like honestly felt like that was like a disappointing thing after like 10 books where you think things are going to happen they don't i actually think that's a legitimate criticism mm -hmm. that you were given like 10 or 13 books of build up mm -hmm. and then nothing happens and you're disappointed by that yeah. i think that's legitimate criticism and it's okay to go on to the internet and reviews and be like honestly like i feel like this was a letdown mm -hmm. and i didn't i was not satisfied legitimate mm -hmm. not legitimate to tell someone they're gonna die <laughs> yeah most readers in the space are like well i'm not like that mm -hmm. and i would say yeah that's like an extreme case mm -hmm. but that's not the only case we have now that authors are so integrated into the yeah. space and people can communicate and to a certain extent authors will cultivate the idea that we're having a conversation mm -hmm. they'll ask questions in their books mm -hmm. and their um like social media posts and stuff right. I think that we need to understand that that is a marketing tactic. Well, and even then, even when you're engaging with people online, and this is something that like I thought of, even though my YouTube channel is small, but it's something I thought about a long time ago. And I actually asked another YouTuber about it. How do you mm -hmm. approach this? Because right. she was a blogger and she would share quite a bit of her personal life. And I was like, how do you draw the line? Because I thought she did a really great job with it. And she was like, you know, this is my job and I treat it like it's a professional job. So I refuse to answer questions that you wouldn't ask someone in a professional setting. If you're coming into my place of business, maybe I'm someone with a, you know, a public facing position at a store or at an office or something. Right. If you're asking me questions that would cross the line in that situation, then that's, that's the line for me. This is still a professional relationship between reader and author, even though it's arbitrated by TikTok. Right. You know, when authors 
ask questions of their readers. I think too many people look at that and think like, oh, they're actually speaking to me. Yeah. When in reality, like, let's be honest, like it, a lot of like marketing 101 is like, ask your readers a, a, a question so they'll engage with your post. Right. Like we need to have like honest expectations of what it means when somebody that we only see on social media is like asking questions. Mm -hmm. Like they just want you to engage with the mm -hmm. post. They're not actually being like, welcome to my life. Please yeah. tell me everything that you right. feel. And, and you know, and you might see an author say like, oh, help me name this character or, or oh, help me name the small town that my cozy mystery is going to come. And so those are things where it's like, I think the author might legitimately say like, oh, that's a really great suggestion or it's a fun way for them to engage with their readers. But they're not asking for like advice on their personal lives <laughs> or whether or not you think they should live or die, for example. Yeah. I mean, a good example I can think of about that, and I'm not going to use the author's name because I don't want to be like calling right. this person out, yeah. but she is an author who re writes a write book series that have some spice in them, mm -hmm. but that's, she's not writing erotica. She's mm -hmm. writing romance and, you know, and occasionally in her books, there are spice scenes, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that is different than what writing erotica is. Mm -hmm. And she gets so much pressure from people yeah. to increase the spice level in her books and put more and more scenes in. I have literally seen her on her social media being like, I swear to you, the characters will sleep together in book three. Please leave me alone. Yeah. Like, please stop putting mm -hmm. this pressure on me right. to be a different type of writer. And I'm very sad to say, I just read, like, I've loved a lot of her book series. Mm -hmm. I've read a lot of her books. I just read one of her most recent ones where she clearly was attempting to do erotica. Mm -hmm. And it honestly, like, not only was like the worst erotica book I've ever read, it was one of the worst books I've ever read because it was completely different than how she writes. And she those was are, trying so hard to be something right. else. And I think it's really important for people to keep in mind, like those are two different genres with two different purposes. I think they're exactly. easy to conflate. Right. Uh, fundamentally, the romance novel is about the romance plot. Right. And so you're going to have a very strong plot line. You're going to have you know, all of the markers of, you know, rising action and denouement and conclusion and all right. of that. And you're also going to have a lot of character development because these characters are falling in love with each other. And Erotic it's a story <laughs> of them coming together. Yeah. And there's just going to be a lot more and not in bed character zone. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you know, whether there are however open or closed door that romance novel is, is still going to have the fundamentals of a romance plot. Erotica is obviously having that its core purpose is, purpose is to be titillating, is to be erotic. Right. Its core purpose it's is to It's a lot about the physical relationship. Sex scenes in it. Yeah. It's a very thinly, you know, <laughs> maybe an action scene here or there to draw them together. <laughs> Which to be clear, like this is, is not a conversation about what Shaming better. or yeah, saying there, like- I don't, I think that there are good erotica writers and I think mm -hmm. there are good romance writers. And I don't think that like, we're here to like discuss like one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. The real point that we're making is that like if someone has set out to write a romance novel and is getting pressured to make it into erotica, mm -hmm. a lot of times that just turns out really, right. really bad because they totally. weren't trying to be that author, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I, we see this pressure too coming into like YA romance spaces too. Yeah. And we've talked about it before where there's increasing pressure to make YA romances spicier. And it's like, well, that's not necessarily appropriate for that audience right. or age level. And it could be even that they're trying to write a younger YA for like a 14 or 15 year old. And it's right. like, well, they're not supposed to be, you know, the, the author is probably very conscientiously thinking about what is the appropriate way to explore romance for that age of audience. And right. then we have like 30 year old women being like, how come it's not spicy? <laughs> and it's like, well, it's not for, for you. you. Like, yeah. I understand that a lot of older women read YA, but uh, why not uh, enjoy? Yeah, but like you have do to what accept you want it on its terms. But like you have to be aware that like this book also has to be to be categorized YA. It mm -hmm. has to be acceptable to be read by a 14, 15 year old, 16 year old. Yeah, and like there's just it's not we're saying that like 14, 15 year old, 16 year old should be kept entirely totally. from the concepts of sexuality. The spice level mm -hmm. needs to be taken into and account. Even like the way that relationships are explored is really important. And I've talked about this before. When you're a grown woman reading a romance novel, and even if you're reading like a dark romance novel, like you can tell the difference between reality and fiction. Right. Your, your frontal lobe is fully developed. And sometimes it's fun to go into, right. it's fun for me to imagine going into Hunger Games. I don't want to be in a black <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Like, you know, and it's fun to imagine having a pirate romance with somebody who, or whatever, whatever your genre of choice is. But when we talk about 
putting sexuality and exploring sexuality in books that are intended for children, I think it's really, I can tell the difference between an author who's being thoughtful about right. walking in an age appropriate way that child through the conversation. the conversation around sexuality, what a good boyfriend or relationship or girlfriend looks like, what a healthy relationship looks like versus romanticizing, which you can do for adults, you know, unhealthy dynamics right because an adult should be <laughs> able to be like oh that's an interesting story but not a relationship i want to be in and put a pin in that guys because we'll we're gonna back. return to this <laughs> we're gonna come back to that <laughs> yeah. but honestly like this conversation does happen on the complete opposite mm -hmm. where i saw the writer ruby dixon who does write erotica I think, you know, in terms of like her writing, she's one of like the healthiest erotica writers, like positive sexuality and, you know, dealing with a lot of the shame and trauma that people have bringing in there. So I think like, I don't have any problem with her as a writer, mm -hmm. but she has talked about how she's had people come into her spaces and be like, oh, your books are a cultural phenomenon, mm -hmm. which they are. I want to be able to engage in that because all my friends are, but I don't read books with sex. Mm -hmm. So I need you to rewrite your entire series and have a spicy version and a clean version, which we're talking about like a 20 book series mm -hmm. here. I think that's just as bad as coming into someone's space and being like, you don't have enough sex in the books for me. 100%. Because it's like, like you're f asking an author to fundamentally change everything mm -hmm. about their story to suit your particular taste. And here, the thing is like, if you have very specific tastes, sometimes you're not going to be able to engage in cultural phenomena. Sometimes oh, totally. you're going to be able to like, okay, well, this is just not for me. And you have yeah. to accept that. Yeah. The world is not here to like cater to you. And it's also like, there's like gazillion books published every year. There's, there's tons of clean romance and sweet romance writers right. out there. You will find ones that re you really do like, and you really do connect with. Go find those authors who are for you. Right. If they're not the biggest authors, you know, ever, that's also fine. Like, mm -hmm. it's okay for you to not be part mm -hmm. of like the, you know, space that says like, oh, this is the book you can, you yeah. should read. I mean, that's a, mm -hmm. a part of too, like what we're seeing people get into is like, you know, a major book will go viral, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone is supposed to read that book. Yeah. And you're a, you're a person who doesn't necessarily like that book. So now you're feeling pressured to be like, I need to be like everyone else and mm -hmm. read this book, but this book isn't my book. So like, how do I engage with it? Mm -hmm. The answer is just don't read it. Like yeah, just because- It's not for you. Yeah, just because the entire world feels mm -hmm. like it's reading a book. If you don't want to read that book, mm -hmm. it's totally okay to be like, yeah, this is not me. Yeah. This is not for me. Yeah. So we talked about authors demanding more spice, authors demanding less spice. What about stakes? And people like not really getting that, like, yeah, we can have really dramatic books with high stakes and we can have really mellow, cozy mm -hmm. books with low stakes. Yeah, actually this, this story, this or this, I happened upon a Reddit thread about the book, Get a Life, Chloe Brown, writes books that are about like everyday people mm -hmm. and they're, relationships are about like dealing with like average everyday things mm -hmm. and there are like dramatic parts of real life mm -hmm. but all of her scenarios are real life scenarios and i saw this reddit thread that was just like thrashing her because oh your books don't have stakes and it's like well no your books have real the books have realistic stakes like mm -hmm. these are things that like real people are concerned about and care about we don't have like a reality in which if two people don't fall in love like the world ends mm -hmm. but we have so many people only reading those type of books that they think that books that don't have that level of stakes are bad mm -hmm. and it's like well no these aren't bad books they're just books that are focused on like reality right. and it's totally okay if you don't want to focus on reality mm -hmm. that's fine but it doesn't make a book bad if yeah. they're choosing to focus on reality right <laughs> now we're gonna move on to readers running amok yes. in the broader world not necessarily just in in their sort of parasocial relationship with authors so a few months ago, this kind of broke out on TikTok and there's been some really great analysis on it, but there was quite a bit of controversy around some of the ways that TikTokers in particular, who were romance readers, were interacting with a particular hockey team as a result of like a hockey romance book that made it really Which big. are big, like sports mm -hmm. romances. That's they're, a thing. They're making a comeback. Yeah. And, you know, and it's one thing to, again, really enjoy a fun romance right. with a, you know, w of whatever theme that you want, but then to take it into the real world 
where these people don't know who you are. <laughs> they don't know what book you've read. And they probably haven't read the book. Right. And there is like a broader context and analysis here for this particular situation where the hockey team had actually invited a larger TikTok creator who is a romance reader to actually make content about this hockey team. And there was a player on there who's quite handsome, who like got all mixed, you know, he was kind of like the guy that got a lot of attention for this. And then there was a backlash for her and she was a black creator. And there's no doubt that there was like some racism involved with the response that she got after like literally being invited in to like make some fun and sassy content about this. And it, it just turned into a whole debacle, but there's still a line, <laughs> you know, right, yeah. that you can't cross because these are real people with real lives and it's sexual harassment. Well, it's a justification. Yeah. And, you know, we have had plenty of conversations about the inappropriate ways that men objectify women in our society. And that is a two-way street. It right. is entirely inappropriate for women to do the same thing with celebrities, with sports stars, with whomever. Even if you think they're good looking and handsome, there is a line that you can't cross. And it's that same thing of like, is this something, if he worked at Target, <laughs> would you be like, shake that thing for me, baby? Like you can't <laughs> say those things. This is an inappropriate thing to say in a public forum. You have to treat it like a professional relationship because that is his job is to go play hockey. Yeah, regardless of if there was a book written yep. about it or not, like he's not actually- He has the right <laughs> to go perform his job in a sexual harassment free Free-no. way. <laughs> for some reason, we really need to have the conversation about separating yourself from the books and TV shows and stories mm -hmm. and movies you, you read and you watch mm -hmm. because frankly, more in an immature place to be like, oh, I like this book so much. Mm -hmm. I'm now taking my like love of it into reality. Yeah. Like your love of that book kind of needs to stay in the book. And, yeah. And it's like, it's one thing to be like, oh, I think this actor is super handsome and whoa, you know, and you're, we're having a conversation with your friend. It's another thing to uh, harass that actor in, in the, the street, street. Yeah. or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And because again, we have this access through the internet, we forget that there's a real person behind that. Right, right. Maybe if they're a celebrity, they're publicist, but have pity on their poor publicist. They don't <laughs> want to read that either. <laughs> I mean, it's like, we talked about like how authors must feel, you know, getting either mm -hmm. death threats or like demands or like disapproval. Yeah. Well, like, how much weirder is it for someone who's not engaged in this world at all, just happens to yeah. look like a person that described in a book? Like, can yeah. you, like, stop and think about, like, how awkward yeah. that must be for them? Yeah. And I think it kind of ties into where we're talking about, like, how women and people should feel free to enjoy, you know, adult content as adults with maturity. But if you, if you're engaging with the real world as a result of what you're reading in this way, you might not be mature enough to handle sexual content in your books. Right. Yeah. Like you need to take a break and step back, back and, and just touch like, grass. Yeah. Like maybe we just need to read some nonfiction for a while. <laughs> and if you feel like touching grass is erotic, find something else. <laughs> if that I mean, means something to you, that's not what I meant. <laughs> I mean, we talked a little bit about this one-on-one, -on -one, but like when people get so into the erotic nature of books, that almost becomes like this, this moment where it's like, I think it has a lot to do with like how a lot of people, especially women, don't feel like there's a safe space to mm -hmm. express their own sexuality. And so mm -hmm. like this becomes, because how often are women not like told either they don't have desires mm -hmm. or it's wrong for them to have desires mm -hmm. or it's wrong for them to be desirable. Yeah. And so a lot of women live in spaces where like that part of themselves like has to be behind a wall at all times. Yeah. But it's wrong to believe that women have like, you know, no desires and don't feel things. And so like they almost have to like go underground mm -hmm. and read books to help them like process through their what own is desires. A normal adult experience. Right. But then that's the only space they're allowed to do it in. And so it becomes an unhealthy way of handling it. Like Absolutely. healthy way, re reading the books and like feeling like processing through your own feelings about your desires. You need to be able to like Unfortunately, like there's a lot of us will not have like a space outside of mm -hmm. that to like really process through. Yeah. But absolutely. you do have to like step outside that space sometimes mm -hmm. and touch grass. Yeah. <laughs> Connecting in your relationships, having really great friendships where you can talk about stuff like this in a safe way, in a comfortable way, even having a therapy relationship where you can talk about things like that in a safe and comfortable way. All of these things are great ways for 
us to develop our sexuality in a mature and safe way. Right. And like the internet can be like, if you are feel safe about it, the internet can be a space where like, if you're feeling safe about talking about your spicy books, feeling safe about talking about reading these helps me process through like not being able to express myself in other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. It's not healthy to go like, oh, I just need this all the time from every author that I come into contact with. This is and the I only also, way. like, I demand that other people who are completely unrelated to this, but look like the character, like I should be able to talk to them in any way that I want to. It's right. Like, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> space. I, yeah, space. I mean, it is really sad that like so many women in mm -hmm. our society in the 21st century don't have yeah. the freedom to like explore their own desires at yeah. all. Like that's a sad commentary on totally. the society we live in. And you know, and there's so many ways that when we were talking about it earlier, we were talking about the way that sexuality is portrayed in media in general and what those relationships look like. And I was trying to watch Game of Thrones with my husband and it kind of got to the point where I was like, I can't watch this with you. Like, yes, the sex scenes are like, it's an HBO show. You're gonna get what you get. You know yeah. what you're signing up for when you, there's a lot of nudity. So, you know, <laughs> be prepared for that, whatever you're comfortable with. But there was actually like, I can't watch it because of the way that the sex scenes are happening. Right. Like, I'm just feeling offended and demeaned by watching this. You yeah, know? just simply having a sex scene is not being positive about it. Yeah. Like, I feel like there are people who are like, oh, because there's sex, then that they're making it okay. Like, right. that's not, yeah. like the portrayal of it is as important as portraying it at all. Yeah. And so, you know, and a lot of people have done analysis on the show that like for the female characters, it's a lot of sexual violence is what happens to them. And like at a certain point, it's like, man, we're now going from the point of like depicting that this is sure is something that happens in the world to like, <laughs> are you advocating for this? <laughs> like the way that this happens in this show, this is real questionable. Which is like, honestly, <laughs> what drives women into just being like, well, I found this like book series that's very positive about female sexuality. So I'm just going to stay here. Right. And this is going to be where I build my walls. And I'm only going to read these books because it's like the only safe space. I mean, that's like sadly legitimate. Like yeah. if you look at media in general, like yeah. sadly legitimate. Yeah. On to the next example <laughs> of reader bad behavior, which is much more recent, is there is a man who's currently on trial. I think he's in Canada, who is, again, a handsome man, good looking, tall, dark haired, and he is on trial for horrendous crimes, but the book talk community found him and are saying that he looks like the hero of their favorite dark romance. And this man has explicit Nazi tattoos on his face. He committed horribly violent crimes against three women. And like all that we've talked about before is like the way that you're engaging in public spaces and is inappropriate and is damaging and harmful to the other person. I don't really care about anything that's damaging and harmful to this guy. I'll be honest. I have very little sympathy. Right. But it really makes me deeply ashamed and deeply concerned about how we're internalizing these dark romance narratives where for women it becomes completely acceptable to say i'm going to idealize that man right who is telling you who he is with the tattoos on his face and what his values are with the tattoos on his face and the crimes he's committed and the crimes he's committed that that becomes, you know, again, it kind of goes back to when we talk about putting romance into YA, we're really concerned about like, oh, we don't want to romanticize toxic patterns right, and, abuse. and abuse inside of relationships. But as an adult woman, you can consume content and you can tell the difference between fantasy and reality. And then I see adult women doing this and I'm like, oh, maybe they can't. Well, I actually like villain romance is probably a good space to like talk about for a minute because that is a genre. Mm -hmm. I've read a couple of books in that genre and I do feel like there are responsible authors in that genre. Mm -hmm. And then there are just like, I would like, it's not just irresponsible. It's like, that's sadistic. You know? yeah. I feel like you can write in that genre and be a responsible writer. There was actually a case I saw recently where a writer, a reader was talking online about like, oh, I want to be married to this guy. And the writer actually came on and said, no. Mm -hmm. I wrote this story about two very traumatized people finding each other mm -hmm. and having to accept what trauma has done to them and, mm -hmm. you know, the things that they do because of that. 
but this is not a story about what you should aspire to. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you right now not to read my book that way. Mm -hmm. And like, I honestly thought that was very irresponsible of her. And I feel like reading her books, like she's trying to make it fairly clear. She's writing a story about like things that honestly do happen to people mm -hmm. and the relationships they might end up because of that. But she's not saying, and this is, everybody should want this. <laughs> the end. <laughs> yeah. Right off into the moon set. With exactly. This guy. <laughs> and you know, to be honest, like, in the time era we're in, like a lot of times, like darker romance characters tend to be a little bit more interesting and have mm -hmm. more of a story arc than like your, your traditional like white hat character. Mm -hmm. So I completely understand why that space exists because mm -hmm. it does allow for interesting character developments. Mm -hmm. But you have to ask yourself, are you writing a villain character that's going through a character arc and has some kind of movement in that? Yeah. Or are you writing like a really nasty guy who abuses women mm -hmm. and, and making that look cool? Yeah. You know? I actually saw a case recently where I had read the book before I saw the advertising for it. And the book was about this character who'd had like a lot of trauma and therefore became like what we call like a morally gray character. Mm -hmm. And the arc is about how he doesn't believe that like anything, he deserves anything good. Right. But through the process, the story becomes a perfectly fine human being, right? right? But like all of the advertising around it made it sound like this book was about this like ultra bad dude that girls love. Mm -hmm. And it was like, was in a space where he didn't believe that he deserved any good in his life. And the story arc is that he gets past that and becomes, you know, someone who is worthy of love because they learn how to give love. It's like a full arc. And then after the fact, I saw the advertising that the author was doing and it was kind of along the lines of like, this guy is awful and women love it. You know, and I was just like, that is not the book that you wrote, <laughs> but like you're like advertising in a space because if you have any kind of darker character, you feel like you have to like lean into that and that aspect to like grab readers. Mm -hmm. And I felt kind of bad for the author because I'm just like, this isn't really the book you read, but you clearly feel pressure to like market it towards people who are kind of weird, <laughs> <laughs> who are playing in this dark romance space in a way that is not appropriate. Yeah. Like if you actually like wanted the person mm -hmm. the character starts out at, we need to step back yeah. and ask why. <laughs> yeah. To put a summary on what we're kind of saying, which is we're not here trying to police what you want to read. No. Read what you like. But we are trying to say, like, you still are required to behave in mature and appropriate ways in public spaces, whether it's with authors or other people in the world. Be a decent human being. Yeah. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, I think at times we have to be like some uh, somewhat like self-analyzing. Mm -hmm. And why am I feeling this way? Why am I pressuring an author to add more and more sex scenes to yeah. a story? Why am I pressuring an author to rewrite her books and remove anything mm -hmm. sexual from her books? You know, like, why am I so angry that this author didn't write a book series the way I want? We might need to take a step back. And yeah. just ask ourselves, like, why are we responding these ways? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, like, books are fantastic. Obviously, we love books. Right. But they are just stories. Mm -hmm. And so why are they affecting us this deeply? Mm -hmm. Probably because we have some serious issues with processing in our society. Mm -hmm. But, like, if you are getting so upset about a book that you feel the need to, like, put pressure on somebody that you don't know, like, this might be a moment to step back and say, like, what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> Am I okay? Yeah. Like, read the books. Maybe maybe it's a me problem. Yeah. Maybe these two thumbs need to go this way. Yeah. yeah. Read the books you want. I am, I am an advocate of that. Like, read whatever you want. But if it's affecting you outside of that reading time, maybe just take a moment. <laughs> let's, all take, let's all touch grass, everybody. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that is a bit of a paradox when we're exploring darker characters, and this happens, in, you know, in film and TV and stuff like that. I keep referring to HBO because they kind of have a sweet spot there where they have these more complex stories about these more complex dark characters. And what's the one where he does, he becomes like a drug dealer? Oh, the Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad, yes. Yeah. And I think this is a really great example where it's, you're not supposed to like that character. Right. He is awful and he does awful things and he treats the people in his life in a horrible way. And he becomes a worse person as the series goes on becomes darker meaner harsher worse right but because he's this charismatic and interesting character you as an audience member are really engaged with his story and you really like him and the same thing happens a lot of times when you have a dark hero or heroine in a love interest as a love interest is they're supposed to be desirable they're supposed to be you know 
a, a, an attractive character. There's, there has to be reasons why the other character is falling in love with them, right? And so we have to be literate enough to approach these topics with, you know, I would say broadening media literacy because it happens so much in TV and film too, to be able to parse out the ethics of a character alongside their desirability and their charisma and their attractiveness and all right. these other things right. that might be poured into this character. Right. I mean, I feel like this is a space where like we're highly judgmental of like people who do terrible things because they get involved in cults or stuff like that. And it's just, this is like everyone is vulnerable to this. Mm -hmm. Everyone is vulnerable to charismatic you know, individuals. We're, we're talking about people being influenced by charismatic fictional characters, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. Like we are susceptible to being drawn into the storytelling mm -hmm. and the characters and the charisma. Mm -hmm. We're susceptible to that. And the important thing is to remember, we're susceptible to that. <laughs> right. And what's even more, this ain't real. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These are fictional charismatic characters. Could you imagine what it would be like if you met somebody like Tom Cruise and he was like, you should join Scientology if you're being sucked in by the fictional <laughs> character. It's, again, it's time for us all to uh, to touch grass. So, uh, take, mm -hmm. Put down your Kindles, ladies. Just for a moment. Just for a moment. Which, like, to be I, honest, I am the type of person that will sit down and read, like, 50 romances. Just, mm -hmm. like, just in that moment where I just want to read them. Yeah. But then you, like, take a break. Yeah. Then you walk away and you read something completely different. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people in the internet space who are just like, no. Yeah. This is what I read. My entire personality is wrapped up in this one type of book. Yeah. And I will not read anything else. And part of me is just like, okay, that's, you know, like, you mm -hmm. can read whatever you want to read. But, like, is that? Oh, healthy to like never step outside of the mm -hmm. space that you've decided is your personality. And, and it's also in combination with then also it bleeding into the real world and you not being able to have like that proper discernment. And you're getting to the point where you're demanding that an author feeds your need in a particular way. What we might be talking about is an addiction. <laughs> yeah. if, is, if that's like, honestly, how oh, your behavior is being affected by this. Yeah. I mean, as someone who loves these books, they are very similar. Mm -hmm. And when someone tells me that they've read 200 of this one genre in one year, I'm just like, do you get like a little bit bored? <laughs> <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> like, that would... When you're in that space, I'm just yeah. like, not even, I mean, like, I, I love these books, but they are formulaic. Yeah. They are. And you read 200 of them in one year. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I... I'm part of the reason why I think it's a hallmark of maybe a less mature reader, which is not to say that like, oh, you you have to like grow in your reading. Not if you, you don't you have know, to. Do, yeah. The, lots of us read for entertainment. That's a totally fine goal. But I will say that, you know, for me, when I did kind of engage in that compulsive and obsessive and like reading repetitiously, you know, I was more of like elementary, junior high. And I've talked about it before, but I was a card carrying member of the Saddle Club. And those <laughs> books are formulaic. And I read them over and over again. And it kind of got to the point where my mom, they were definitely below my reading level because I could read like three in an afternoon, you know, and I was just like, because they weren't challenging enough for me. They weren't long enough for me. I had outgrown them. And my mom had to be like, hey, <laughs> we're going to take your really into horses in a weird way. <laughs> okay? You're getting weird about horses. We're going to go ahead and say you don't need to be a card carrying member of the saddle club anymore because they would send me like four a month or whatever and I'd read them all that night it's time for you to mix it up and I appreciate my mom doing that for me right it's like that's healthy we all need to kind of break outside of our comfort zones it's okay to enjoy our comfort zones but we all need to break outside of them as well yeah I absolutely okay I have to ask you though like what so here's what I do and okay I've been in the genre for too long mm -hmm. I need to break out that's when like hardcore nonfiction comes out mm -hmm. for me yeah that, like I'm suddenly reading about like I will one minute be reading an alien romance and the next read it I'm in like Vietnam <laughs> <laughs> well it, it's less of a problem for me now because I've just grown so much as a reader and changed so much as a reader I do just typically like variety so I'm very rarely reading you don't the same books back need like that hard <laughs> shift to the last <laughs> have it currently um i might be a little bit more extreme <laughs> about everything <laughs> yeah emily is what we call passionate <laughs> <laughs> extra, extra. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I would say that I'm frequently coming back to home base, which is classics for me, as you guys know. But I'm also just as frequently like going out into some of my favorite genre fiction or nonfiction or, 
something political or something historical. And you're very willing to walk into spaces that you know you're not gonna like. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'm always, well, it's part of like my openness. I'm always willing to try something new. The thing is, is like, if a book, dis if a genre disappoints me enough, which like, I'm not a romance girly, so I'm I'm over here critiquing romance. So you don't have to forgive me. I, I very rarely read romance because I just really can't. It's not. It's not for me, okay? <laughs> it's just not the genre for me. I'm going to take a moment to just bring up a memory. We used to have a book club that was based on, like, topics. Mm -hmm. And so we'd bring books for that topic. And the topic was romance. And we were sitting next to each other. And I brought Ice Planet Barbarians. And you brought... I don't remember what I You don't about. remember? You brought, like, the, uh, sorry, the uh, King Arthur legend. Oh. Everybody in the room was just cracking up. It's like we were both sitting there with our books. It's like this is the like, range. This is the range of romance that you can do. Yes, that's right. That's right. Oh, good job, Pastor. That was, that's a great choice. I would do that again. I agree with myself. There you go. I was really happy with myself too. Because <laughs> I got people talking about positive sexuality. <laughs> So you know what? That is the depth and breadth of you can do in and romance. And the interesting thing is we both kind of walked away going, yeah, this message has been seeded from like the very, very early, early yeah, stages like the ideas the and the concepts. Like romance doesn't just have to mean like what it's become. Right. And that's what we both like about it is the, is the positive ways that like these relationships get formed and the beautiful things that can happen when you're in love. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the crazy things that can happen. That too. Yeah. That too. <laughs> It, it is, I think, like, it needs to be acknowledged. It's a great genre. Mm -hmm. It can be a horrible genre. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it's one of the genres that gets, like, the worst rap because there are a lot of really bad books in this genre. Yeah. But it's also, like, a great genre. And you yeah. can have a lot of fun. And, you know, you can range from really deep topics mm -hmm. to just, like, I just fun. wanted to just have fun and be okay for a while. You know, yeah. that is a hallmark of the romance genre that I think is really great. Yeah. And I think despite its formulaic quality, which is true for every genre fiction, like every, you know, style is needs to fit its sort of like category to be successful within that genre. And we've talked about that before, specifically with like mystery and stuff. When I mean, like, analysis. like mystery is, you know, such a huge genre. It's literally like six bodies, you know, one body, six suspects and a detective. Right. Like every book is doing that and it's still great. Like yeah. There's no judgment on formulas. Exactly. But, and, and yet we can see how much range can happen <laughs> right. within working within these constraints. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of creativity comes in where it's like, whether you're talking about setting or whatever type of issue the couple needs to work out together. Right. And, right. And, and it's just, I don't know. It's quite flexible. It's very flexible. Sense. And also like, I think the difference between a good writer and a mediocre writer is a writer who can work within a formula and create something fantastic. I don't judge writers who work within formulas because mm -hmm. if you're a good writer, the formula doesn't matter. You can make that work. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot. A little okay. Bit. So who are, do you have a couple of recommendations for authors that you think successfully work within the romance formula, but like do something unique or fun or really excellent within it? I do enjoy Ruby Dixon. Um, and I, I think that she's hit a stride since the Ice Planet Barbarian days and like a lot of her books since then. And she is an erotic reader, writer. Just, there's a lot of spice. So yeah, there's, she's take that. But, but she, Literally. like I said, every single, so her concept is like every single book is a different mm -hmm. couple, even if mm -hmm. they're in like a same universe. universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And each one like deals with a very specific issue that plays into like the physical aspects of relationships. And I think that that's really, really positive mm -hmm. what we need. In terms of like villain romance, I would mm -hmm. say something like the Harrow Fair series or Immortal mm -hmm. Souls by Kathleen Ann Kingsley. Mm -hmm. She does a really good job of being like, I will not look away from like what villain villainy means. Like mm -hmm. she's not the type of person who's like making isn't it cool, excuses. you know, like or isn't it cutesy? Yeah, exactly. Like she, she will murder four people yesterday. <laughs> Yeah. Like she will look dead on into the consequences yeah. of like what this means and analyze like why people choose these pathways. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, that's the responsible aspect of like villain romance. Those two are my, really my, my top favorites that I will come back to over and over again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. But also like read trigger warnings, people like oh, read yeah. trigger warnings. I always like when I do romance novels, I always read reviews because mm -hmm. There, it is a space, as we talked about in our episode on consent, where mm -hmm. like it is a space in which people that I 
morally disagree with like their concept of what love is Mm -hmm. are. And so I always read reviews to know what the trigger warnings are. Cause I've had people like seen people review books of, I am a sexual trauma survivor. That's why I didn't like this book. And it was like, sweetheart, you should not have read this book. Like that is not, that should have been something that you just did not do. It's very important to know your own limits, Mm -hmm. to read trigger warnings and decide for yourself, is this something I can do? Mm -hmm. And again, if it's not something you can do, totally okay. Yeah. Don't do not judge yourself. If you're just like, I'm uncomfortable with this. That's okay. Don't let anyone pressure you into this. I mean, honestly, like I worked in an all female, um, office when 50 shades of gray came out, Mm -hmm. became like this, this moment of like really hardcore peer pressure. Mm -hmm. If you weren't reading 50 shades of gray in that office, Mm -hmm. you weren't one of the like in girls, which is so sad to think that like we're existing in these spaces as grownups. Like it became very much like being in high school. I read up on that series. I knew that that was not something I was interested in. Right. And there was like one other person in the office who was just like, no. no. And like, People like the other people in the office ought to treat this like, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with you. If you don't want to read a book, there's nothing wrong with you. And like, I feel like the internet is being used as the space of like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Like, why don't you like peer pressure? Turns out it exists in peer circles online too. And that, that is a huge part of like what I see on the internet that's negative. It's like people feeling like they have to read things that they're personally uncomfortable with mm-hmm. or that they're not allowed to read things mm-hmm. that they sh- they actually that want to. Taboo. Yeah. There's always like these like rules that we mm-hmm. put down on people and then, you know, they're either good or bad based on like what they're reading. Yeah. I think that's really sad. I think so too. Yeah. Um, you're, you're a grown adult person with your full autonomy. Go forth and thrive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like it's, I talked about in one episode where I saw someone online being like, I have not read books. Like I'm not a book reader, but I've decided I want to be a fantasy girly. Mm-hmm. So what should I read? And it's like, no, 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 no. Just read some fantasy books and see if you actually want to do that. Yeah. Because like what you're expressing now is you don't want to be in books. You want to be in the in crowd that's in yeah. fantasy. And when it comes to reading books, just try some stuff out and see if you're yeah. uncomfortable. Honestly, like for me, Ice Planet Barbarians was the first book I read in the erotica zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I read it was like, I had seen like some articles written about like the phenomenon of it. Cause it mm-hmm. was like, it's a self-published book that published or sold while it was still self-published over a hundred thousand books, which that does not happen. Yeah. So it was a phenomenon. So I was reading, you know, the book that, and I did like read trigger warnings and stuff. And a part of me was like, so I said to myself, Oh, I can't read stuff like this. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> at that point i was almost 40 I'm a years old. Woman. Yeah, i am almost 40 years old i can read this book and decide whether or not i want to read it you right. know and whereas like before i was in like a cultural like zone of you're told what mm-hmm. you can and can't read you're right. told what is you know i as an adult want to just read books and see if i like them or not i yeah. want that freedom yeah. and like honestly that's been really healthy for me because there have been books where i've read where i'm like i don't like that yeah. I, don't, I don't like that. So I'm not going to keep reading that. Yeah. But I'm not afraid of being like, oh, is someone going to judge me because mm-hmm. I'm reading this book or is someone going to judge me because I'm not reading this book, mm-hmm. which is a space I've been in mm-hmm. with both ends. And yeah. like, I think part of being a mature reader is just being like, I can responsibly read and decide what I'm going to read. <laughs> I think that is a great point for us to end the podcast on. That was a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> so if you guys have any romance suggestions, other things that you've seen in the reader, writer space that are of concern that you think we should talk about, leave them in the comments. Leave us a note. Oh, we got a comment on one of our podcasts on Spotify. Oh, what do we got? What do we got? Someone asked me, asked us, but they asked about what was the title of my compilation book that I was talking about all of the Dostoevsky note. Yes, Dostoevsky short stories that I had read together. Oh, yes. Um, and it was a bind up that I got from Barnes & Noble. I think they still sell it. And it was uh, double notes from the underground and other short stories. But there are many publications out there that have several of his short stories like bound up together. But the double notes from the underground, White Nights, like some of the titles that are coming to mind that were in that compilation. So that's to answer that question. By all means, lead questions. Yeah. We'll answer whenever possible. And... Hopefully we'll be able to stick on a little bit more regular track now. We've gone over some hills. Yes. <laughs> Through some valleys. <laughs> Through some hardcore valleys. <laughs> <from> others' house. <laughs> and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.